All right, hello everyone. Today we're going to be closing out the section of the course on personal identity over time. So um, uh, when we talk about personal identity and philosophy, there are two different things that we could mean. First, we could talk about the re-identification question. And so this is like the question of like how and why we're the same people over time like metaphysically speaking. So this is what we've been talking about when we're talking about Locke and, and Thomas Reed and Buddha, right? We're talking about uh, this question of, is there a, like an essential part of ourselves that does not change over time? And we see that like Locke and Buddha like disagree on this question about whether there's a, like a metaphysical self uh, when, we, when we're looking at Hilda Lindemann and we're looking at Susan Bryson, we're asking a slightly different question about what identity is. Uh, this is what Lindemann calls the characterization question. And so this has to do with what, what they call a narratively constitutive identity. Um, this is like the question of like, who are we, right? This kind of very existential question. It's not about am I the same person over time, right? Or if I were to like hop into a portal and get destroyed, but have an exact copy on the other end, right? That's not kind of, that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in who we are. What is it that makes us who we are? Um, what gives us the distinctive features to kind of that, that helps us paint the image of ourselves to ourselves, right? Um, and so, this question about narratively constitutive identity centers on roles, relationships, and stories or narratives that kind of make us who we are, right? So we remember various things about ourselves, and we tell ourselves a story, and those stories help give us a kind of self-conception, right? Um, and I've already said this, but uh, this is the, the, the kind of question we're, our, we're, we're talking about when we're talking about Lindemann and Bryson, right? So this is also an important question and has to do deeply with the question of identity, but it's just a slightly different question. Okay, so what, what is a narratively constitutive identity? Well, it deals with, of course, narratives, right? So a collection of stories that we tell ourselves to understand our place in sort of the social nexus, right? So for instance, um, why is it? Like, how do I conceive of myself, right? Well, there, I, I tell myself a story. Well, I used to be in school, right? And now I am... Uh, in a relationship with my family. And I have all of these stories about my schooling and I have all these questions about my family, right? And all of these stories help give me a conception of who and what I am to myself, right? Similarly, we engage in a number of different roles, right? Uh, for instance, um, uh, um, roles involve uh, or, or create various expectations that we have of one another. So for instance, Lindemann says, uh, if, the, if your answer to the question, uh, who are you is I'm the bartender, right? Well, I'm going to expect you to know how to make a martini. Whereas if your answer to the question, who are you is I'm a practicing Muslim. Well, then I won't expect you to know how to make a martini at least not necessarily, right? So our roles help, are, are partially constitutive of what it is that we expect of one another on also what it is that we expect from ourselves as well. So for instance, my role as your professor helps structure a set of norms uh, for how it is that I'm supposed to interact with you all, right? Uh, and then also relationships and families are central to the formation of one's identity, right? So uh, uh, Lindemann talks about uh, Carla, her sister with, um, uh, I think it's anencephaly. Uh, at any rate though, um, uh, the family relationship 
helps build who it is we are, right? So much of our narrative comes from our family relationships, um, but also from other various friendships and relationships that we have, right? If you have a spouse or a boyfriend or girlfriend, right? Or a partner, uh, those relationships help build a kind of self-conception. Who am I? Well, I am a son. I am a father. I am a husband or a, a, a spouse, right? All of these things help constitute who it is that we are, right? Okay, so, so what is this? What, is, what are the philosophical implications of this account, right? So we're going to see those more concretely on the next slide, but um, Lindemann wants to talk about holding. And so holding is the activity in which we undergo with one another to hold one another in our identities, right? So for instance, um, um, identity work, she calls it, is not an isolated process. No, we're rather it's contingent on a number of relationships that we have to one another. And, and our obligations to one another follow from these various identity constitutive uh, narratives, right? So, um, so she says that holding is kind of the active participation in the formation and maintenance of each other's identity. Right. So you're probably thinking like, well, what is holding? OK, so holding is constitutive of four activities. Right. Uh, first. Person A has some kind of feeling or thought or mental event. Right. And then person A will express through bodily expression or through language those mental events, feelings, different phenomenon. Right. So for instance, if I feel sad, I'm going, I'm perhaps going to cry, right? And so what we have is a feeling of sadness and it is expressed through my bodily expression of crying. Now here are the latter two, the important ones. So person A has had a feeling and has a, a bodily representation of that feeling or an expression. And then other people will say person B, recognizes those feelings and mental events based on the expression that uh, person A gives. And then person B will respond to those feelings and mental events, right? So uh, um, recognition and response are kind of the central uh, uh, facets of holding. Right? How is it that we ought to recognize one another? How is it that we ought to respond to one another? Right? And this can go poorly and this can go very well. Right? So for instance, if I recognize, remember the, uh, the example of the cop in, uh, in the text, the cop recognizes the young black man as uh, a car thief, right? And that's like a problematic uh, response because he's not, or a, a problematic recognition because he's not recognizing what is true about this person, that he's just a driver who's driving his mother's car, right? And then the officer, based on his problematic recognition, would problematically respond by either detaining or taking into custody uh, the person, the driver of the car, right? And so... Uh, responses and recognitions can go poorly and badly. Uh, first of all, if whether they track what's true about the person uh, and whether they are, they make sense within the context, right? So um, holding is central to reinforcing or decimating our narrative identities, right? Um, so if I say something to you, suppose um, I send you an email and I say that you're a really bad student, right? That would be a kind of recognition that's problematic, right? Even though it might be true, it's going to affect your identity as a student, right? Because your identity is partially 
uh, constitutive of your role as a student, right? Um, and what I'm doing is I'm threatening that self-conception. And that seems to be like wrong, right? Um, and so what, what we get out of, out of this talk about identity is an account kind of how, of how we ought to treat one another, ethics, right? Um, so the big broad points here are that holding is constitutive of four activities, right? Those activities can go poorly or they can go well, right? Um, and depending on how they go, they're either going to reinforce various parts of our identity or they're going to harm or decimate various parts of our identity. And that practice has moral implication, right? It's important, morally speaking, that we treat one another well with regards to holding and how we hold one another. Okay, um, so one of the cool things that I really, really enjoy about this book is that is that holding is not just a practice that we do, right? Um, holding is instead an account of personhood. Um, so, so Lindemann just wants to say that this practice of holding one another in our identities, that just is personhood. Personhood is not about having a capacity. It's not about having some kind of merit, right? But rather it's being able to engage in this kind of activity with one another, right? Um, so so um, if I'm making this video for uh, an intro to philosophy class, and so we're not talking about personhood, this video may be used in an ethics class later. But, uh, but the personhood question is really important for ethics because potentially we can't do certain things to persons than we can do to non-persons, right? Uh, so let's suppose that hunting is morally okay, right? It might be okay to kill a duck, right? But hunting people is not okay, right? And that's because uh, human beings are persons, whereas ducks are not persons. This is just like a shallow picture, but we see that the personhood question is really important. And so philosophers have debated for a really long time about like what makes someone a person, uh, is it rational agency? Is it the capacity for language? Is it our intentions or being able to intentionally act, right? Or is it like self-awareness? We, we're, we were like aware of our feelings. We can kind of articulate our feelings, right? Uh, we can be aware of our mental events, right? So that awareness makes us morally that more valuable than creatures that can't do that. And so um, Lindemann's account says, no, 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 no. Just take out all of that stuff. Rather, personhood is just about this practice of holding one another, right? Um, is just about this practice of reinforcing, creating, um, or potentially destroying one another's identity, right? And, and uh, one last note is that her point in chapter one is that holding can occur even if the person held can't understand that they are being held, right? So for instance, Carla had no idea what was going on, right? But her family could still understand and recognize and respond to various things about Carla, right? Okay, so in this lecture, we've talked about what narratively constitutive identity is, why it's important for holding and how holding is important for both personhood and ethics. Thanks.